It wasn't easy for Corrie Ten Boom to forgive the Nazi capturers who had tormented her at Ravenbrook. They had caused her to suffer horribly. Even worse, they had caused the death of her sister, Betsy. Ten years after her release, Corey ran into a lady who wouldn't look her in the eyes. Asking about her, Corey was told the woman had been a nurse at a concentration camp. Suddenly, the memories flashed back. Corey recalled taking Betsy to the infirmary to see this woman. Betsy's feet were paralyzed, and she was dying. The nurse had been cruel and sharp tongued. Corey's hatred now returned with vengeance. Her rage so boiled that she knew but one thing to do. Forgive me, she cried out to the Lord. Forgive my hatred, O Lord. Teach me to love my enemies. The blood of Jesus seemed to suddenly cool her embittered heart, and Corey felt the rage being displaced with a divine love she couldn't explain. She began praying for the woman, and one day shortly afterwards, she called the hospital where the nurse worked and invited a woman to a meeting at which she was speaking. What, replied the nurse, do you want me to come? Yes, that's why I called you. Then I'll come. That evening, the nurse listened carefully to Corey's talk, and afterwards, Corey sat down with her, opened her Bible, and explained 1 John 4, 9, and reads, In this the love of God was manifest towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. The woman seemed to thirst for Corey's quiet, confident words about God's love for us his enemies. And that night, a former captive led her former capture to a decision that would make the angels sing. God had taken Corey's subconscious feelings of hatred, she later explained, and transformed them using as a window through which his light could shine into a darkened heart. So please, turn your Bibles to 1 John. We're going to be conducting our study today in chapter 4, and looking at verses 19 to 21. And our message this morning is called, He First Loved Us. So as you're finding your place in God's Word, I want to share that we're going to be focusing on God's role as the initiator of love. True love has no other origin than God. We will also explore the effects of experiencing God's love and why the love of God and the love of others cannot be separated. So before we consider the text together, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for everything that you're doing. I want to ask you that as we're taking this time right now to read your word, Lord, remind us of the love that which you've shown us, an overwhelming love. We know that this upcoming week is leading up to our celebration of Christmas, remembering that you have sent your Son into this world, Lord, so keep that top of mind for us, Lord. Remind us why we're celebrating, why we are so joyful during this time of year. Remembering something that we shouldn't remember just once a year, but remembering every moment, every day that you sent your son to pay a price that we could not pay. Hope when there was no hope. Mercy when we didn't deserve mercy. Love when we were unlovable. Thank you, Lord, for everything you're doing. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for not giving us what we deserve. But showering us with your love. Guide us in all that we do today for this glory and honor of your name. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So again, our text is 1 John chapter 4, verses 19-21. And the passage reads, We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So in church, let's take a look at our first point. That God is the initiator. Verse 19 again reads, we love because he first loved us. So love, true love that is, always starts and originates from God. Now our society will make up this narrative that love comes about somewhere within the person. Many of the stories you'll hear that Hollywood produces and best-selling books will talk about this inner love that the person may have. The narrative, the banner that the world holds is that love is love. Most people believe that love is an emotion that comes and goes almost as it pleases. But the reality is that the wisdom of man, as always, fails to understand the truth and wisdom. The wisdom of man always desperately falls short of God's standard. And it is this man-centered way of thinking that leads people to twist the definition of what true love is. And unfortunately, this type of thinking of love has even found its way in pulpits, in supposed houses of God, where they're no longer holding to the standards of the Word of God, but they are appealing to the world. We cannot do that, church. We have to stand on a firm foundation, a solid foundation. It does not matter how people will think of us. Because the origins of what true love is comes exclusively from God. So I want you to consider this example. I want you to look at Israel, for example. Now, why of all the nations did God choose Israel? Was it because they did something amazing? No. Look at what it says in Deuteronomy 7, verses 7 through 8. Scripture answers that question. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. See, God did not choose Israel because of its sheer population and size. And he didn't choose them because of what they did or would do, because if you pay attention to the narrative, of scripture, what it shares that Israel did, they did a lot of things that were very displeasing to God. No, God chose Israel for his own purpose. And that's something that we need to realize. See, he chose to love them first. In fact, the act of us even loving God back is really a miracle in itself, because not only does God love his people, he actually changes them on the inside so that they are able to really love him back. Just take a look at this truth found in Deuteronomy verse 30, chapter 30, verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. See, from the very beginning, it's always been the same. God is the one who loves us first. He has to transform us to be something that we weren't before, something better than what we were before. And then and only then are we able to then love him back. You see, church, 
When you're a slave to sin, when you have a stone heart, you are separated from the chief shepherd. And it is impossible to love. Everything that you do has an origin of selfishness. That's why God is always the initiator. He's always the one who loves you first. And when he loves you, he does not leave you in your sinful state. He does not leave you as a slave to sin. Instead, he shatters any one of those chains that you have and releases you from this bondage of sin, the slavery to sin. And he turns you into an absolute brand new creation. And as it says here, he circumcises your heart. He turns that heart that was stoned, that could not receive anything in it before, to a heart of flesh. It's pumping blood now. It's alive. And the ultimate act of love that God did for us was performed in his sending of his precious son into this very broken world. Jesus lived a perfect life of obedience to the Father. And he voluntarily took on a punishment that we are the ones who deserved it. And we can't forget that he took on the full wrath of God in our place. He took on a punishment that was meant for us. You understand that the sin that we did, we deserved the punishment. We were his enemies, but Christ took it in our place. And that's the reason why that during this time of season, a lot of people are celebrating the incarnation of Jesus. See, because it's not about our love for him, but about his love for us. As it says in 1 John 4.10, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, never forget that fact. You did not choose God. You did not simply, out of the blue, decide, you know what, I'm going to follow Jesus today. You only chose to follow him because of what he did to you. He first chose you. Look at the language that Jesus uses when he speaks to his disciples, for example. John 15, 16 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Simply put, you cannot take credit for any portion of your salvation. You did not love him, but he loved you first. You did not choose him, he chose you first. And you did not follow him, but he opened your eyes to the truth so you could see the way in which you have to walk in order to follow him. But not only that, his love for you and me, his choosing of you and me, this enabling us so that we are able to follow him, this was all done while we didn't deserve it at all. See, if you pay attention to what Scripture says that we deserve, we should be hated by God for our sins. But He loves us still. We should be forsaken by God for our wickedness. But He chooses us still. We should be blinded from the truth so that we don't see the path, but instead He illuminates the way for us so that we may have eternal life. See, this mind-blowing reality of amazing grace is that God loved us while we were dead in sin. See, as it says in Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 5, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with, with which he had, which he had loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. 
That should be something that we continue saying over and over again. By grace you have been saved. By grace you have been saved. It is nothing else that we did. It is by grace that we have been saved. And as a recipient of that infinite love that God gives us, we must love others as He loved us. We must be imitators of the one who saved us, who saved us from eternal death. And we must follow the commands that it says in Ephesians 4, verses 32, all the way into Ephesians 5, 2, which wonderfully pre presents what godly love looks like. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I want you to consider this note in the ESV study Bible that says this. Christian love is a gift from God, demonstrated supremely in the cross. God's love always takes the initiative. And the love of Christians is a response to that love. Likewise, all morally good actions are good not because they conform to some arbitrary human standard of good, but because they are rooted in imitation of the morally perfect character of God and conforms to God's command. See, that's the thing. When non-believers talk about that there is no God, all you have to do is ask them, well, then how, what's the definition of morals? What, how can you define what good is without a standard of good? And I can tell you, no matter how much of science they know and wisdom that they have, the books they read, they start stumbling under words and practice circular reasoning and have no idea how to answer that question. Without God, you can't define something as good or bad. You must have a standard in order to find whether it's good or bad. God is our standard. And that's where all goodness comes from, is from God. See, the actions that are done in this world that are genuinely good, I mean, done with good intentions, not just what looks good. A lot of things may look good, but the reason they're being done is for selfish intent. It's like that person who does something good and takes a picture of it and shares it on social media. They're doing it for their own glory. No, I'm talking about doing something genuinely good that only comes from the genuine love. And that genuine love can only come from a person that has first experienced God's genuine love, God's infinite love, God's overwhelming love. So that means that the children of God are always to genuinely love. In fact, this is the mark that shows the world who are the true believers. It's not just about what you can say with your mouth. Many people throughout history have claimed to be Christians. It's very easy to claim to be a Christian. In fact, you may believe in your head all the things that Scripture says are true. And at that point, you've simply gone to the same level as the devil. Because he knows all these things are true because he's an eyewitness to it. But do you believe it in your heart? Do you trust Him? Do you surrender to Him? It's not about being able to answer some questions. You're not going to have a theology test when you get to heaven. It's about what's in your heart. And that's why John is saying here, it doesn't matter what you say. It's what you're doing. Because that reveals what's really in your heart. Are you loving others? Because if you're not, there's a problem. Let's look at our next point. Proof of God's love in us. John says in verse 20, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. I really enjoyed the note from the Expositor's Bible commentary on this. It says, If one fails the test of loving his visible brother, he makes it certain that he does not love the invisible God and thus proves that there is no true love in him. 
You see, we're supposed to be able to show others whether we're believers or not. See, some people have this strange idea that you can love God and treat people poorly. But by the authority of the Word of God, that's a devilish lie. There's no truth to that whatsoever. You can't call yourself a Christian and be so mean and hateful to people and say, oh, by the grace of God, at least they're a believer. No, they're not. And to pat someone on the back for that, you're just contributing to that too. If you are a true believer, then you will display signs as a believer. And one of the key signs is loving others. And especially the emphasis put on believers because they are our closest people that we're supposed to be a part of. And of course, even our enemies we're supposed to treat with love. I want you to remember what John said previously in our study in 1 John chapter 3, verse 6. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Again, John has made it clear we're not talking about perfection here. I always want to give a disclaimer. We're not talking about perfection. But are you habitually sinning over and over and over again and living a wicked life? Or does your life look like when you do sin, you immediately repent and you turn away from it? And through time, you're being sanctified. You're looking more like Christ over time. The reality is we can't have it both ways. Darkness and light cannot have any fellowship together. Scripture has made that clear over and over again. Yet the world, the world loves gray. The world loves to not define what truth is and speak in very vague terms. Be careful, because it's wickedness that they're presenting. Light and darkness cannot mingle together. If you really love God, then you will love others. This is really the only response that we can have when we have an ocean of love poured into us. We have so much love that goes into us that all we can do is share love with others. And again, as John says, to do contrary to that is to be a liar. 1 John 1, 6 says, If we say we have fellowship of him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. In fact, John specifically addresses the issue of how we treat our brothers and sisters in Christ again in his epistle, showing you that the fact that he's repeating it, repeating it again is it's a very important thing that we need to pay attention to. 1 John chapter 2, verses 9-11 through 11 says, Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. This is why we need to ask ourselves, are you loving other people or not? We have to ask ourselves, do we love our brothers and sisters in Christ? That includes the difficult ones. Do we love our family members? including the ones who have hurt us. Sometimes it's the family members who knows us so well that they can hurt us in ways that other people can't. Do we love them all? What about our friends? Those times that they may have done something that felt like they backstabbed us. Do we love them? How about our coworkers? Ones who don't know Christ. Ones who may be trying to sabotage your career. Do you love them? How about your neighbors? ones that you may have issues with, or they may talk and say terrible things about you. What about those who are very clearly your enemies? Those that you know hate you. What about the people who hate the people that you love? Do you love them? You see, the world will respond back and say, get revenge on them. 
Pay them back what they deserve. Don't forget what you deserve. Don't forget what I deserve. Every single one of us deserves to be punished. So can we really hate those people? If God has forgiven us for all that we did to Him, can we really hate others no matter what they did? How you answer those questions will determine what road you're walking on. So ask these questions to yourself and be honest with yourself. This is not one of those questions you want to get wrong. Those who love others, even when they don't deserve it, they are following the example of their master. Do you remember what Christ said on the cross? The amount of spiritual torment that he was going through because of us. The amount of physical agony that he was going through because of us. On a cross, naked. The pictures that we have of Christ, we cover them up, it's just to do it out of respect. But he was hung up naked. And he cried out, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's our master. And he was sinless. Every single person in this room is a sinner. Even if you've been born again, you're still a sinner. But we have to realize that he has forgiven us. And we have to forgive others no matter what they do. Because that's the power of the Holy Spirit in us. We can do the things that were once impossible for us to do. Because every good thing that we do in our lives after we become a believer, is all credit to the Holy Spirit. And those who hate others, it doesn't matter what the reason is. It doesn't matter what you've gone through. Those who hate others are following the example of their own master. But I want to warn what it says in 1 John 3.15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you, that, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. If we hate others, it proves that we are walking in the darkness and we have no idea in which we are going. It means that we are totally lost. It means that we are confused. And what we need to do then is repent and believe. The only way to go from darkness to light is to repent and believe. That is the only way that we will ever experience love and be able to show love is to repent and believe. I find it difficult when people nowadays don't talk about repenting and believing because that's what Christ came to do. Read what Christ did and how he preached. Repent and believe. If you don't know about repentance, then how can you believe? Every born again believer has repented and believed. So hear me when I say, follow the commands of God. For within his commands, you will find eternal life. So let's take a look at our third and final point. Love for believers. Verse 21 of our text says, And this command we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Remember what Jesus said in John 15, 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. The love God has shown us is always connected to the love that we show to others. In fact, Jesus made it clear that the whole sum of scriptures all the commands in the Old Testament and the New Testament, all of them fall within two categories. So let's take a look at what Jesus said in Matthew 22, verses 36 to 40. When he was asked, what was the greatest commandment? This is how he responded. The passage says, Teacher, which is the great command in the law? 
And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. That's everything. On those two commands. And Paul even goes and says in Galatians 5.14, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now you first take a look at it. Wait, wait, Paul, how did you sum it up just with a quick phrase like that? How is the whole law about loving your neighbor? Because the reality that Paul was showing here, that you cannot love your neighbor without first loving God and being loved by God first. See, it all hinges on those two things. The command to love God and to love others cannot be separated and every command in Scripture always comes down to these commands. And even the clearest, most identifying mark of a true believer is founded on this fact of us loving others. Look at what it says in John 13, verse 34 and 35. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So you see, if one claims to love God, and that was the only mark of a believer, just simply loving God, no one would be able to question that person's claim. Why? Because it is impossible to see whether a person loves God on just that fact alone. God the Father and the Holy Spirit are invisible. Jesus has ascended into heaven. And if you memorize scripture, where you know all this head knowledge about theology that doesn't prove that you're born again. However, loving others, yeah, we can see that. That can be observed. Those actions reveal whether we are true followers of God. And that's why Jesus explains that it's that reality, whether we love others, that shows the world whether we are his followers or not. So despite what people say, your actions speak volumes and reveals what's on the inside. So with that reality, remember the wisdom and truth found in Colossians 3, verses 12 to 14. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So do you claim to love God? Then ask yourself, do you have a compassionate heart? Are you compassionate towards others? Do you display kindness and humility to others? Are you patient with people and bearing with them their burdens? Are you forgiving others in the same way in which you've claimed to be forgiven? Does the description that love binds everything together describe your interaction with others? You must be warned, 2 John 9 says, Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Our obedience to Scripture reveals whether we're genuine or not. Faith Life Study Bible says, The believer's responsibility to show Christ-like sacrificial love to other Christians is not optional. It is commanded by God as a way of displaying his love to the world. The way in which God communicates his love for the world is by the followers of Christ displaying his love. It's crazy, but God has chosen us to show his love to others. It's a responsibility of believers to do this. So what else does love look like? Again, we always have to go through scripture. Romans 13, 8 says, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves 
another has fulfilled the law. In Philippians 2 verses 4 and 5, let each of you look not only at his own interest, but also at the interest of others, having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So it is imperative to have a servant's mind. So we need to stop just looking at our own selfish interests and model, model ourselves after Christ. Can you imagine the despair that we would be going through now if Christ was only concerned about his own interests? There would be no incarnation, no cross, no salvation, but Jesus looked at the will of the Father. Remember, going to the cross and going through all that, he said, Father, take this cup away from me, but not my will, your will be done. And he looked at our well-being because he says it, I voluntarily gave my life. So when interacting with others, we need to do the same thing. We need to care about others and be concerned about their own well-being. Our Lord, he was a servant leader. He was Lord and teacher. Yet he served and he served and he served. And we can see that clearly done in John 13, verses 14 to 15. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. But Christ washing the feet of the disciples was not the greatest act of service that he did. That great act came at Calvary. As 1 John 3.16 says, By this we know love that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Do you see that? We need to be ready to lay down our lives. It doesn't mean that only in situations where somebody could lose their life, we'll jump in front of a bullet. Because in fact, that sounds sometimes a little too easy. Because now you just go out all heroic. Remember, before Jesus died for us, he lived a perfect and obedient life. And that means when we serve others, we need to model that. We need to live for others. Be willing to die, but live for others. That's key and it's important. So are you laying down your life for others? Are you serving in which the way that Jesus would serve? Do you love because he first loved you? As this message comes to a close, I want to share this. On the morning of Sunday, November 8, 1987, Irishman Gordon Wilson took his daughter, Marie, to a parade in the town of Enniskillen, Northern Ireland. As Wilson and his 20-year-old daughter stood beside a brick wall, waiting for English soldiers and police to come marching by, a bomb planted by IRA terrorists exploded from behind, and the brick wall tumbled on them. The blast instantly killed half a dozen people and pinned the Gordon and his daughter beneath several feet of bricks. Gordon's shoulder and arm were injured. Unable to move, Gordon felt someone take hold of his hand. It was his daughter, Marie. Is that you, Dad? she asked. Yes, Marie, Gordon answered. He heard several people begin screaming. Are you all right? Gordon asked his daughter. Yes, she said, but then she too began to scream. As he held her hand again and again, he asked if she was all right, and each time she said yes. Finally, Marie said, Daddy, I love you very much. Those were her last words. Four hours later, she died in a hospital of severe spinal and brain injuries. Later that evening, a BBC reporter requested permission to interview Gordon Wilson. After Wilson described what had happened, the reporter asked, How do you feel about the guys who planted the bomb? I bear them no ill will, Wilson replied. I bear them no grudge. Bitter talk will not 
bitter talk is not going to bring Marie back. I shall pray tonight and every night that God will forgive them. In the months that followed, many people asked Wilson, who later became a senator in the Republic of Ireland, how he could say such a thing, how he could forgive such a monstrous act. Wilson explained, I was hurt. I had just lost my daughter, but I wasn't angry. Marie's last words to me, words of love, had put me on a plane of love. I received God's grace through the strength of his love for me to forgive. For years after this tragedy, Gordon Wilson continued to work for peace in Northern Ireland. Love can do miracles. Just as Marie Wilson's last words to her father lifted him onto the plane of love, so God's love for us lifted us onto a whole different plane, enabling us to love others no matter how they treat us. So no matter what someone has done to you, no matter the hurt, no matter the pain, do not imitate the devil, but instead imitate our Lord and Savior. As 3 John 11 says, Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. So I want you to go forth this week this week that's leading up to Christmas, and as many people are running around getting their last minute Christmas plans done, many of them are distracted from the true reason for the season. I want us to go out there as the church and go and love others. Love them with a godly love. A sacrificial love, a love that does not look like anything in this world. A brotherly love. A love that originates from God. And let me close with the words of Paul found in Romans 12, 10, as he encouraged the body of Christ. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. To God be the glory. Amen.